The dawn of a new age often hinges on invention. One invention in particular revolutionized every aspect of human communication. It changed how we listen to music, allowed Houston to speak to astronauts in space, and led to the creation of the smartphone sitting in your pocket right now. Hi, I'm Jay and you're watching Plasma Channel. Now, when it comes to revolutionizing human communication to the point of where life was never the same again, really only one thing comes to mind. It's a concept so incredible, yet completely rudimentary, that the only way to explain it is to build one. I'm talking about radio. No, not high-tech transistor radios from 1953. This one's actually, I think, from 1958. Crazy, huh? No, no, no. I'm talking about the original radio, Spark Gap Radio from 1890, which just so happens to be the original purpose of Tesla coils. In order to do so, I'm going to have a little bit of help from a friend of mine over at MIT. That's MTU, actually, but I appreciate the comparison. Hello, everybody. My name is Dayton Artema from the Blueprint YouTube channel, and I'm here today to help Jay design his old school spark gap radio. Over on my YouTube channel, we focus on real engineering, which is electronics. Meanwhile, our boy Jay is passing off putting a 9 volt battery on your tongue as science. So, I'm here to help Jay with the electronic theory behind radio. And hey, maybe you'll see more of me later. But for now, it's back to you, Jay. <laughs> Thanks, Dayton. But with Blueprint's help, Plasma Channel will bring you a recreation of the first radio. Blueprint will build the small scale, and then Plasma Channel will scale it up. So here's the science. Hmm. And 9 volt batteries. Welcome to the modern age of communications. Now I'll get to the build quickly, but first some really crazy history, okay? Now contrary to what a lot of us were taught, radio itself was not invented by Marconi. Even Tesla himself, with his famous ambition of spreading wireless energy across the globe in 1890-ish, well, he wasn't the first either. In actuality, both Tesla and Marconi, well, they followed in the footsteps of previous researchers. Namely, these two gents, James Maxwell and Heinrich Hertz. In fact, many experiments since the mid-1870s showed the existence of electromagnetic radio waves. Well, Heinrich Hertz applied Maxwell's equations on electromagnetism and in 1886-1887 designed the first method for detecting spark gap radio waves. It was simple. He found if he pulsed energy across a spark gap with two open-ended capacitors on each side of the gap, he could take a loop of wire with a spark gap in it as well and move it several meters away and that gap would experience a spark as well. Essentially, the first spark gap coil combo was the transmitter, and the one that was unpowered yet produced a spark still, well, that was the receiver. It was receiving energy through thin air. He had not only sent a signal through thin air, but he created the world's first spark gap radio. It was this discovery that launched a revolution. He then later went on to publish a paper on electromagnetic radio waves. However, this is where it gets kind of crazy. At the time, radio waves were seen as just a novelty. They had no commercial significance. And in fact, Heinrich Hertz once said to a class, I quote him, radio waves are of no use whatsoever. Radio is just an experiment that proves Maestro Maxwell was right with his equations. We just have these mysterious electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with the naked eye, but they are there. He was quite the prophet. This discovery led to an industry, an industry which formed the basis of the most revolutionary leap in communications in modern times, the creation of radio waves and communicating at the speed of light across the globe. Now, Dayton and I discussed quite a bit how to build our transmitters, and as we discussed, legality came to mind. For all the viewers at home, operating a spark gap transmitter has been outlawed in the United States since 1929, and for good reason. Both of us built our transmitters and tested them in concrete-lined RF-shielded locations, meaning radio frequency interference is not going to be coming from our location and we will not be interrupting local radio communication. Otherwise, 
this would be completely illegal. In particular, I'm performing my tests in an area that is concrete lined and 15 feet underground for safety. Regardless, I've contacted the FCC prior to building and I recommend everybody do the same thing before getting involved with radio because radio is a government regulated affair. All right then, prior to my build, I highly suggest going over to Dayton's channel and checking out his video of the small scale build. Go give him some love. Okay, on to the build and reliving scientific history. Kicking off the build, I'm using acrylic for the top and bottom of the base. These are then screwed together into three wooden columns, which makes for a very sturdy base to house the electronics. The first component to go in is also the component that makes this whole thing work. The spark gap. The spark gap is fired by the next component to go into place, the power source, which traditionally was an induction coil. In this case, we're using a car ignition coil. But this ignition coil is not going to run itself and needs something to pulse power into it. So we're using the 555 timer circuit, adjustable from 1 to 17 kHz and run by the also evil 555 chip. I decided, you know what, I want more power, so here's a second ignition coil. You can see the first ignition coil on the bottom and the second on top, and they are wired in anti-parallel configuration, basically giving double the voltage out. I also went ahead and wired up the coils. Then to make this transmitter portable, a 12 volt battery was added. And to turn this on and off, how can I not use a telegraph switch? The corresponding output is completely Morse code capable. Now radio transmitters need both an electrical ground and an antenna. So let's work on that electrical ground first, which is going to go right here. This is actually going to act as more of a counterpoise than ground because I won't have a solid ground connection. At this point, all that's left is to add an antenna. I'm going to add a very small, very shoddy antenna and do a primitive low power field test. So I'm going to add this metal piping here to hold down the switch just manually. And what a beautiful noise that spark gap makes. Oof, like an angry banshee. But if that sounds angry, wait till you hear the radio across the room. How cool is that? But really, I've had enough of that. The low power test is working well at 22 feet. That's just crazy. You know, believe it or not, these are the only components needed for a really inefficient radio transmitter, minus the antenna I'm going to use for the higher power test. But you'd also be amazed at how simple of a concept radio transmission is. I think I'm going to leave that up to Dayton to explain. As it turns out, any arc of electricity is capable of generating radio frequencies, though generally random discharges of electrical energy create wide bandwidth radio energy, meaning that it's all over the frequency spectrum. This electrical noise isn't particularly useful on its own, but if we want to transmit it over a large distance, we would use an antenna. Antennas operate on the principles of electromagnetism. What we have here is called a monopole antenna. It's simply a wire that doesn't go anywhere. Just a simple rod of metal. What will happen is that the charges in the circuit will rush up the antenna, and as they do, it'll create a magnetic field. It's been well established for a long time that moving charges, or electrical currents, generate a magnetic field as they move through a conductor. Once the charges become high enough, the sparks will jump across the gap, and all of those charges will rush away from the antenna. If we let this process go, we see charges oscillating up and down the length of the antenna, making alternating magnetic fields. If we hold a receiving antenna near the transmitting antenna, what we get is the same process in reverse. The alternating magnetic fields from the transmitter cause charges to oscillate in the receiver, which we can see on the oscilloscope. But these signals are inherently random. That might not seem particularly useful, but this is how the earliest radios operated. Marconi's earliest radio worked a lot like this. The high voltage was generated by an induction coil, which I've replaced with a flyback transformer from a tube TV, since they're practically the same thing. Marconi would have used a solenoid and Leyden jar condenser as the inductive and capacitive oscillator. Since I'm from the future, I use a ZVS driver. On the input, I've placed a telegram switch, so now, every time the switch is pressed, we get a radio signal, which disappears once the switch is released. Information could be transmitted using this technology as Morse code, a series of long and short radio pulses. 
For instance, if I wanted to send the emergency signal SOS, which sounds like this, I would type this on the telegram key. Which on the oscilloscope, we can clearly make out which pulses are short and which ones are long. But this radio only works over a very short distance. If we wanted to transmit over a longer distance, well, I'll let Jay over at Plasma Channel tell you about that. Well, the obvious solution to broadcasting radio further is to use more power. But even though the brute force method does work and works well, it's not always the most practical approach. Instead, we can make our antennas more efficient through two main methods. First, making your antenna as tall as possible. You see, without the century's worth of knowledge that we have now, Marconi had to go with what he found worked best. And what he found worked best was attaching his antenna to either a kite or to a tower to get it as tall as possible. Talk about ingenuity. And second, which is related to the height, is have a resonant sized antenna, meaning the antenna length should be equivalent to half of the wavelength of the frequency at which you're transmitting at. This is how you efficiently propagate radio waves using an antenna, and it's also the same process with which Tesla coils create resonant voltage rise and make big sparks out the top. Now that you have a grasp at how radio works, I've attached the permanent extendable five foot antenna, making the spark gap radio complete. You can see all the components from the spark gap to both of the ignition coils, the batteries, which is the ultimate power source, the telegraph switch, and even the control box, which controls the radio's audible frequency from one to 17 kilohertz. Okay, no more theory. It's time for a serious outdoor test. It may not look it, but I am surrounded by all four sides with RF shielding. Super cool, Morse code at 33 feet. But this transmitter can still do better, so I'm cranking up the power in an underground parking garage. Still using the same radio, and both the transmitter and the radio are grounded. These tests were done in the middle of the night, and you can see all five pixels of me placing the radio. Now, the parking garage is a dead zone for AM radio waves, so the only thing you're going to hear is from the transmitter. It works! Okay, let's see what this thing's made of. Let's push this transmitter to the max. I've opened up the spark app to the point that it barely wants to fire. Will this transmit 100 feet? So we're able to transmit radio out to at least 100 feet, using nothing more than just a spark gap with an antenna attached to it. This is the original spark gap radio. This is how radio used to work. Now it's one thing to transmit radio waves using a spark gap transmitter like this, but honestly it's completely pointless to transmit radio if you don't have an accurate method for detecting radio waves at a long distance. And back in the 1800s, they didn't have things as convenient as a pocket radio. So, they had to rely on a slightly more primitive method. Of course, nobody had oscilloscopes in the 1800s, so... How then were Marconi and Tesla able to receive these radio signals? Well, at first, they used one of these. This little piece of technology is known as a coherer. I made this by grinding down some iron, any ferrous metal will work, and put it between two conductors in a plastic tube. The iron filings have a very high resistance when left alone, but exhibit a very interesting property when a radio signal is detected. As you can see, the LED turns on now, and if I turn off the radio, it stays on. What's happening is that the strong field being made by the transmitter is causing the iron filings to cohere and as a result, the resistance drops dramatically, allowing the LED to turn on. Once cohered, the iron filings will stay cohered until a tap from a hammer decoheres them.
So there you have it, how to transmit radio and how to receive it. Everything from radio stations to cell phones, satellite telemetry, and even radar, they all started with this, the original Spark Gap radio. And I'll be honest, before I filmed this video, uh, I didn't have a really big appreciation for radio. That has changed. And hopefully at home you've gained an extra appreciation for radio as well, and you'll learn something cool. If you did, feel free to tell me in the comments down below, and don't forget to go check out Dayton's channel. Thanks for stopping by, and don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to Plasma Channel. Check us out on other social media, and feel free to check out our various other episodes. With science every two weeks, you stay classy.